Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Connors. I'm the director of the Albuquerque Museum, and it's a great pleasure speaking to you, the Albuquerque Historical Society, this afternoon about history and the way that we tell history, both looking to the past and looking to the future. That's always a challenge that we have at the museum. I really love the Albuquerque Historical Society for so many different reasons. Um, and I really love the way that you engage so many different scholars, uh, both professional scholars and amateurs. I particularly loved last month's presentation on um, Little Beaver Park um, and the idea that Albuquerque was promoting itself as a tourist destination at a time when that seemed to go so against what else was going on here in Albuquerque. So um, I'm going to share my screen and I look forward to hearing um, any of your questions or seeing your questions on chat come up and those will be transmitted to me. And um, hopefully we will have some time at the end to engage in some discussions. And so I'm going to now share my screen. And I hope that you are seeing the correct screen. Um, this presentation is very much inspired by a number of different projects, uh, most particularly historic exhibitions here at the Albuquerque Museum. And once again, I do want to express my, I think, I need to share this screen. All right. Um, and I do want to express my great appreciation once again for the Albuquerque Historical Society. And uh, one of our great objects in the collection is one of the signs that advertised the Albuquerque Historical Society Museum, which of course was the precursor to the current Albuquerque Museum. And um, I love to always tell that story that this museum was developed from the community. It was not a government decision to establish a museum. The community decided that we needed both a history museum and an art museum. And in 1967, those ideas were merged into what was then the Museum of Albuquerque. Uh, later, we've had a couple of different names. And of course, we were for a while the Albuquerque Museum of Art, History and Science. And when Explora and the Natural History Museum took on more of those responsibilities, the museum was able to focus on history and art, which we've been doing now for several decades. And what I was very interested in, the first time that I visited the museum, I went to the astonishingly rich exhibition called Only in, sorry, uh, called Four Centuries in Albuquerque. And uh, the Four Centuries exhibition, as I'm sure many of you remember, uh, told a very rich story uh, with a slight mention to uh, pre-European era New Mexico. And then it launched right into the Spanish era and moved up to about the Civil War. And then what I always found was interesting is that the history of Albuquerque with the arrival of the railroad and up to the present was simply told in a first slideshow and then a film and then a video. Uh, so basically more than a hundred years of Albuquerque history was told in a video, whereas the previous several hundred years was told through tangible objects. And I think this is a clear indication of just sometimes how difficult it is to tell more recent history through objects. Um, this is one of those objects that we've always wanted to get on view uh, in the museum itself, the wonderful trolley that ran between Old Town and what was then called New Town. Uh, the railroad uh, district after 1880. And I love this photograph because it shows that sort of younger generation that could have been me as a young kid. Yes, I used to be blonde, um, but it certainly wasn't me. And the trolley was then adapted uh, with wheels added onto it, tires, rubber tires, 
and was used as many of you may remember um, in different celebrations here in Albuquerque. But when we look back to the way that Albuquerque presented itself, basically starting in 1880, we see a really interesting focus on the future, the new, the contemporary, rather than an interest in looking to the past and looking to history. Um, even in this um, map from the early 1880s, we see up in the upper distance, we see what we would now call Old Town in the plaza uh, with the flagpole. And then we see a very stylized version of the volcanoes on the Western Mesa. And then if, so this is Old Town as it's represented here. Of course, the location of the Albuquerque Museum is over on this side, that uh, wonderful tall flagpole with the San Felipe de Neri Church and then uh, Central Avenue or uh, what was at this point called Railroad Avenue um, and the old fairgrounds spot. So it's very interesting to see the way that map makers and people that were talking about the city told the story. And so often Old Town looms sort of off in the distance while Central Avenue winds past Huning Castle and down to the bustling uh, railroad section, of course, uh, starting in the 1880s with the arrival of the railroad in Albuquerque, there was a whole new focus of our community uh, to the east, to the arrival of the railroad and to the new, to the commercial. And we see that not just in uh, printed maps, but we also see this um, in this wonderful uh, pair of paintings by Leon Trousset created in 1885. Leon Trousset, as I'm sure you all know much better than I do, was an itinerant artist of French heritage that traveled throughout the Southwest, documenting the historic centers of many of the communities throughout the Southwest. And this is the view, very typical of his views of the plaza in Old Town. And I particularly love it, um, showing a diversity of heritages, including uh, an Asian American um, gentleman, uh, people riding on burros, people riding in very modern buggies, and, um, and also the sort of stereotypical image of a padre or a priest purchasing watermelons from Native Americans who are incongruously sitting in the middle of the road in a way that I don't think is necessarily very safe or very historically accurate. But what's so interesting with Trousset is that here in Albuquerque, he painted two very different views. In most towns throughout the Southwest, he really only painted one image. Uh, but here in Albuquerque, he painted a second one, uh, much more panoramic. And we can see off in the distance, uh, the towers of San Felipe Neri Church, an old town right at the base of the more, somewhat more realistically rendered view of the volcanoes and the escarpment on the West Mesa. And then uh, Huning Castle is here. And then Railroad Avenue or Central Avenue extends almost up to where we are and then sort of disappears into the hills. But again, it's an image of Newtown and the railroad repair shops here, uh, basically eclipsing the old presence of the town of Albuquerque. And um, I love the way there's this romantic image of this man with his horse looking over Newtown and then extended off to Old Town. Uh, and then the highly non-romantic image that for some reason uh, Trousset included here in the foreground, what looks like a trash heap. And uh, I don't know if this was a commentary about Albuquerque in 1885, or possibly a positive statement, if we wanna see it that way, that the town is rich and booming and uh, has a lot of detritus that uh, needs to be cast off. And of course, uh, most of these appear to be tin cans or um, basically larger uh, tin containers for what could have been lard or oil of some kind. Uh, and they're just cast off onto the escarpment on the east side of town. And of course, uh, soon thereafter, the University of New Mexico would be built behind our point of view. 
And um, what I think is interesting is that in that painting, there was this celebration of the railroad, of the arrival of the new. And of course, now we look back on these spectacular feats of engineering, and we tend to think of them in a romantic way, the passing of the railroad era. But what I like to think about is in the early 20th century, some of these buildings were the most advanced technological structures built in the United States at that time. So here, just after the turn of the century, Albuquerque is building high-tech structures for the servicing of the railroad um, in a way that completely flies in the face of other marketing programs uh, that were in place or that were being developed to talk about New Mexico uh, as a land of three cultures, a land of ancient heritage, a land of great tradition and history. Uh, and we see that though in many of the different marketing uh, aspects of New Mexico or even popular storytelling about New Mexico. Here in an edition from Harper's Weekly, we see the identification of Albuquerque and here we see a procession on Corpus Christi Day uh, at San Felipe Neri Church in an old town plaza that looks much larger uh, than it actually feels to this day. We see some reference to ancient native uh, settlements, but in all of the images of Albuquerque, we see new. We see the new structure, uh, a view from the rail yards looking uh, towards the rest of Newtown uh, with this commercially available cast um, um, metal uh, figure of a Native American that was basically just bought out of a catalog, a sales catalog, to welcome native peoples before the construction of the Alvarado Hotel. Uh, we see these distant views of Albuquerque, which provide some sense of romance, but there also is this looming of new architecture, Hooning Castle, of course, and views downtown uh, in a way that really makes Albuquerque look very up-to-date as a city in the United States. And I love looking at these historic uh, publications. This is a publication, a reprint of a publication from 1882 that talked about New Mexico and Colorado and the opportunities there for, as you can see, businessmen and uh, businessmen who are looking for Western opportunities um, now that the West has at least been made more easily accessible through the arrival of the railroad. And these publications are fascinating. Uh, this one from 1892 um, is particularly intriguing to me because it is illustrated with dozens of photographs of Albuquerque, talking about the opportunities of Albuquerque. And in the illustrations, we see, yes, a reference to the Spanish colonial past or the Mexican past here. Um, this to me feels much more like a Texas or a California uh, Spanish colonial structure than it does in New Mexico. But looking through this drawing um, of what ostensibly might be seen as a gateway to Albuquerque, we see the new downtown looming in the background with buildings as modern as buildings were being built anywhere in the west of the United States. You can even see uh, the rail lines for the trolley cars in the middle of the street. You can see the telegraph lines there looming. And in this document, they don't talk about ancient heritage in New Mexico or tourist opportunity. They talk about business opportunity. And of course, these were publications promoted by the Albuquerque Commercial Club and other pro-commerce organizations. But instead of talking about ancient heritage um, or the diversity of cultures in Albuquerque, they brag about the number of miles of paved boardwalk sidewalk uh, here in Albuquerque. They advertise and brag about the number of miles of telegraph lines and the number of certified telegraph operators here in Albuquerque. And they even talk about the arrival of the telephone 
and the number of telephones that are available in Albuquerque, all as a way of saying Albuquerque is a place where you can do anything that you want in as modern a manner as you want. I also love the fact that the Albuquerque Illustrated, uh, the illustrations talk about business. So here in the upper photograph is the office of Halloran and Washington. Uh, I don't know what sort of business uh, they were in, but clearly if those are Mr. Halloran and Mr. Washington, they are ready to receive you. They're sitting at their desks, ready to get their work done. And the same is absolutely true of the lower image, the front office of the lawyer B.S. Rohde. So there is the Rohde Law Firm, uh, the precursor to the Rohde Law Firm, and they are ready and waiting for their clients to come through the door or ready and waiting for you to bring your business from the Midwest or the Eastern part of the United States and establish it here in this booming metropolis of Albuquerque. By 1908, uh, they added Im uh, color imagery. Uh, they added this really sort of wonderful, almost Art Nouveau design for the city of Albuquerque. Again, we think of Art Nouveau as an older style of design, but certainly in 1908, it was absolutely up to date. So there we see these stylized Native American vessels almost looking like a genie lantern with smoke rising out of them or mists rising out of them that echo the mists or the smoke rising out of the booming industry in a skyline that might ostensibly be Albuquerque. Now, any of us who know the Albuquerque skyline realize that there's no way that that is Albuquerque in 1908, particularly with all of those uh, church spires in those styles. So it's much more of a sort of generic booming city, but used to advertise Albuquerque. And then on the back of the cover, uh, we see again, a stylized Native American vessel. And that uh, vessel really is much more Middle Eastern or North African in its aesthetic than Native American. But you see a map of the West, you see New Mexico cut out, and then that bright red arrow pointing to Albuquerque. And uh, I just love the way that all of these lines of communication, of trade, of transport seem to meet right at the community of Albuquerque, uh, clearly indicating that this is a booming spot. This is a spot where you can establish your business. And the last image there um, has this wonderful, I, um, modern, very modern and very scientific looking chart uh, that shows just what a great climate Albuquerque has um, as an opportunity for, uh, for business. And I find now in this day and age, uh, certainly when we have issues of the pandemic and we have other responsibilities, um, so many of the challenges of the drought are something that uh, has been pushed to many people's back burner. But this year as we're heading into a horrible drought year, I love that downspout image, um, the downspout that looks much more middle, um, middle American or East Coast American, a downspout pouring water into this chart that shows just how much water and rainfall um, Albuquerque gets. That's more than Phoenix, that's slightly less than Denver, less than Los Angeles and less than San Antonio, Texas. But there is Albuquerque with a good solid eight inches of rain every year a good place to do your business. And I love the last line there in this passage. It says, the altitude is ideal and the air exhilarating. Uh, what a great way of promoting our community. Uh, the other parts of the illustration in the magazine, the magazine from, um, sorry, going back to the other one that was published in 1892, um, is that they talk about the University of New Mexico. Um, the importance of the University of New Mexico to both the current economy of Albuquerque and to the future economy of Albuquerque. And I always find it interesting when people talk about the allocation of statewide resources. When uh, Albuquerque decided that it wanted the university and Santa Fe decided that it wanted the state penitentiary. Um, Santa Fe also missed the opportunity for the railroad so Albuquerque got both the railroad and the university. I think uh, we made a good choice way back then. 
Um, and certainly the university is a dominant force in our cultural, intellectual, and economic life here in Albuquerque. But look at that building. Um, and of course, uh, those of you who are aware of the history of the University of New Mexico know that the architecture uh, was very much originally planned to be as modern and up-to-date as any architecture in the United States. So there was this Romanesque revival style of architecture inspired by Henry Hobson Richardson and other great East Coast architects. Um, but the Armijo block downtown was also designed in that same Romanesque architecture. Um, and the Albuquerque Commercial Club in that same red sandstone Henry Hobson Richardson style Romanesque revival architecture. Uh, these are buildings that certainly don't look New Mexican, uh, but they are solid. And uh, to my eye, as an architectural lover, uh, I would love it if these buildings were still extant and still looked like this, um, as opposed to certainly at the University of New Mexico, there was the desire to make everything more uh, typically New Mexican. So the first university building was adobe over, just as in uh, the mid 20th century, uh, city boosters decided that Old Town Plaza would look more historic and antique and perhaps more intriguing to tourists if they adobied over all of those Victorian buildings and the wonderful arts and crafts structures that uh, used to populate Old Town Albuquerque. Um, I feel, feel that that was a mistake and I think many people feel that's a mistake now. But again, it was a lack of conviction the way that we had at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, that it's okay to be modern in Albuquerque. Um, but many cities, uh, particularly our neighbor to the north, Santa Fe and Taos, were marketing themselves uh, on the past and on historic heritage uh, rather than on modernity. And this all comes into play when the museum has the challenge of contextualizing an object like this. Some of you may have seen this shirt recently on view in an exhibition we did on the psychedelic rock poster. This was the shirt that Jimi Hendrix wore when he played a concert in uh, 1969 at the Civic Auditorium here in Albuquerque. So is that history? Is that Albuquerque history? My feeling is that it very much is Albuquerque history, but it doesn't, it's not easy to tell that history if we are talking about three cultures in New Mexico and only three cultures, how does Jimi Hendrix, how does the Civic Auditorium fit into that history telling? Uh, there have been moments when we look back into the past in Albuquerque and just as in the wonderful presentation that you all had last month on Little Beaver Town, um, we also in the 1930s, the early 1930s, had another attempt to tell the old story of the West. And there was an opportunity to basically create um, the Native American, recreate a Native American festival every summer. And so these women were baking bread in Ornos, um, not in, I mean, that photograph looks so timeless. It could be anywhere, it could be Africa, uh, it could be anywhere in the West, but that was at the southeast corner of Central Avenue and Wyoming. And uh, this was a village that was created for a four day celebration of Native American heritage. And so here Pueblo women were baking bread in what was then the, the middle of the, uh, the East Mesa desert. Um, and you can certainly identify it with the wonderful looming image of the Sandias in the background. This photograph was taken about 1930 by Otilia Hanna, uh, one of the great women artists, um, women photographers who's currently um, celebrated in an exhibition organized by our um, photo archivist, Jillian Hartke. And she created a exhibition called We Lead, Other, Others Follow to celebrate the women photographers that were so important to early Albuquerque history and industry. Another image from the um, Native American pageant uh, here in Albuquerque, these images of figures 
uh, that look like they're standing on top of a Pueblo style Kiva, and yet many of them are wearing uh, plains headdresses uh, to probably to look more native than uh, traditional Pueblo regalia would be, uh, would appear. But um, those structures, I'm not exactly sure what that fake Kiva was made out of, but it was probably um, a wooden structure covered over with paper mache, plaster, concrete, something absolutely modern. And it was basically a stage set for the Indian pageant that, as I said, occurred uh, over the span of four days every summer. Uh, that too, like uh, Little Beaver Town, was a financial disaster and um, only survived for a few years here in Albuquerque. Um, but we see this push and pull between history and uh, the current reality in so much of material culture, whether it is the tin cross on the left by Higinio Gonzalez, um, the, that is considered to be a traditional Hispanic art form, uh, the tin work. But of course, tin work did not uh, precede the arrival of tin cans uh, bought by, brought uh, to New Mexico by the United States military and then later mass in, imported into New Mexico thanks to the railroad. Um, and we see the same in Native American design. Would anybody say that this Kiwa or Santo Domingo necklace, probably from the 1930s, is not Native American? And yet, what is Native American about the use of plastic or uh, battery casings for the creation of jewelry? Uh, does anybody complain now that this Thunderbird pattern in those tabs are made out of red plastic as opposed to coral. Well, we can certainly say this is not the way that Native American jewelry would have been made 300 years ago, but it was certainly the way that Native American jewelry was made 90 years ago with the recycling of materials that were brought into New Mexico. So we have to be open to that constant change of material culture, the constant change of material sources for Hispanic communities for Native American communities here in New Mexico. Um, and I love the way that here at the museum, we have the, a wonderful series of uh, watercolors that document Albuquerque. And they document Albuquerque uh, from 1869 in a way that we would not tend to think of Albuquerque being told. Um, what is that in the foreground? Well, it clearly is a farm. Uh, with very lush crops growing in the foreground while the sandias loom in the background. So these watercolors by Collier were not necessarily attempts to tell the ancient story of Albuquerque, but they were the attempts to tell the current story of Albuquerque. Just as in 1948, we see this image of downtown Albuquerque that now looks um, sort of historic and nostalgic, uh, perhaps maybe even hauntingly uh, empty, uh, completely bereft of individuals, the way that an Edward Hopper painting of New York City would similarly be bereft of individuals. And uh, there's the Hilton Hotel, uh, one of the great triumphs, early triumphs of the Hilton Hotel chain, which would be the chain, um, and the Sunshine Theater lit up in that wonderful neon um, sign. That's the underpass of Central Avenue with the railroad going over it. Um, so a very modern image of Albuquerque uh, that now harkens back to an earlier period uh, that we could very easily become nostalgic about. But at the time when William Warder was painting this image, that was the modernity of the high rises, the new downtown of Albuquerque that was as up to date as any downtown anywhere else in the West. Uh, we can look at historic textiles like this masterful Hispanic weaving and look at this weaving probably from the 1840s or 50s and uh, look at it as absolutely New Mexican and absolutely celebrating the best of the Rio Grande weaving style. And yet the patterns that were used there very much are inspired by Mexican weavings, 
or if we are even more accurate, very much inspired by Middle Eastern weavings, uh, by weavings of what we might identify as Persian rugs. And the color itself, cochineal, was certainly not a dye that was used in ancient weavings here in New Mexico. It was brought into New Mexico as a new, better red dye. Um, we also, looking at material culture, culture um, at a time when Taos artists and artists in Santa Fe were depicting uh, Hispanic individuals in a way that was very much of the earth um, in ancient tradition bearing manner, we look at this spectacular double portrait of the Armijo um, couple and we see them depicted in 1906 in a way that clearly they wanted to be depicted, not the way that outside romantic artists depicted their reality, but very much dressed in an up-to-date manner. Um, a full double portrait like this was very rare anywhere west of the Mississippi in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, so they could be a couple from Philadelphia or Charleston, um, South Carolina or New York City or Boston. They were as up to date there here in Albuquerque uh, as they wanted to project themselves. And that storytelling is so much in conflict with the way uh, that so many outside artists decided to tell the story. Yes, um, John K. Hillers, a great documentary photographer, uh, was photographing and documenting Native American tradition here in this um, image called Zuni transportation. We could consider this a document of history that yes, there were still traders in Zuni in 1906 that were trading this way and that were loading uh, their goods onto burrows, but there were other ways that Native American communities were also being looked at. Um, in a somewhat later image by John Sloan, uh, one of his great prints that comments on the commercialization of Native culture in New Mexico. Uh, this is a print called Knees and, um, or sorry, uh, Southwest Tours, um, Indian Detours. And here, um, the Harvey cars, um, are basically pinning in the few Native American dancers that can fit on the plaza because there are so many other vehicles that are parked on the plaza uh, to allow tourists to come in and view that experience. Um, also, when we go back to um, 1882, we can see the way that Old Town Albuquerque was depicted uh, here in this wonderful drawing uh, by Cronau who was a German illustrator who traveled throughout the Southwest. He depicted Albuquerque this way. And uh, clearly on the left, you can see a somewhat modern Mexican style lamp. You can see what must have been a sign for some sort of business. Um, and the adobe blocks at the top were set almost like crenellations, almost like a little castle. Um, but Clearly there, right in the middle of Old Town, we see those, that telegraph line um, with the telegraph wires that clearly indicate that while there is this sort of dereliction of Albuquerque architecture, there's also the arrival of new te technology. So the old is coexisting with the new. When Cronau sent these drawings back to Germany and they were illustrated, uh, in a book of the American Southwest, this was the print that was created with the addition of a couple of priests. Um, and there, there, the store has been renamed Gonzales store. Um, and you can see that same lamp, you can see the same sort of signboard there. But look at what has happened to this telegraph pole. It's no longer a telegraph pole. It is now a monumental crucifix to indicate the dominance of Christianity or specifically Catholicism on the Southwest. I think it's so interesting that here, a street in old Albuquerque in German um, that Europeans, uh, let alone the rest of the United States 
was unable to accept the fact that the telegraph had arrived in Albuquerque. And um, instead, they replaced the modernity of the telegraph pole with a crucifixion looming over the city. Truly astonishing. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these images uh, just because there um, is so much else to talk about. Uh, but I love this image of um, by Helen Nadler from 1970, where clearly the mo modernity of Albuquerque um, is almost impossible to see because of all of the smoke of construction or most clearly in 1970, the smoke of demolition, of demolition of the old, um, and in particular in 1970, the demolition of the Alvarado Hotel as the new city rises in the background. So again, we see in the Jajinio Gonzalez recycling of tin work, we see these wonderful motifs, all made out of materials that did not exist in New Mexico before the 1850s. And so now we celebrate Hispanic tin work in uh, a way that uh, declares its ancient legacy or its old legacy and long-standing tradition here in New Mexico. Uh, but at the time that Higinio Gonzalez was inventing a new aesthetic vocabulary for tin work, it was absolutely new and modern. And the same is true with Apodaca um, and uh, the way that he incorporated mass-produced block-printed wallpaper motifs into his tin work. So using imported uh, wallpaper as a decorative motif to create a nicho for an image of the Virgin. Uh, this same sort of story of the new and innovation can be very easily and directly told with the tradition of jewelry making. And one of my great fascinations is the way that Hispanic jewelry very much gave way to Native American jewelry in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and when we look at this little brooch that's about an inch and a quarter in diameter, we look at this gold filigree and realize that this is jewelry that could have been created anywhere in the world. Filigree jewelry like this was very popular in Spain uh, and throughout Europe, but it was also very popular in Mexico. It was very popular throughout North Africa and the Middle East and even in India. So filigree jewelry like this is not unique to New Mexico, but at the time that the Abieta family was creating filigree jewelry like this, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, they advertised this filigree to indicate that it was the best quality filigree. It was advertised as Mexican filigree, not New Mexican filigree, not Hispanic filigree, but to show its quality. It was advertised in national campaigns, advertising campaigns, including in Scribner's Magazine and Harper's Weekly Magazine, as well as in the newspapers in Chicago, Philadelphia, and New York, the Abieta brothers were advertising Mexican filigree from New Mexico as the great jewelry tradition here in New Mexico. And so when we look at a spectacular filigree necklace like this, also by the Abieta brothers, and their first shop was established in Socorro, and then they established another shop in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and then finally in Santa Fe. When you look at a filigree piece like this, you realize this was as good as filigree was um, anywhere in the United States created at the time. Um, and that modernity of the 1880s was very much indicated by a portrait like this, um, Juan Jose Baca, uh, was a uh, business leader here in Albuquerque, uh, later became one of the mayors of the new city of Albuquerque. And in this portrait of Juan Jose Baca from the early 1800s, I mean, early 1880s, uh, probably 1883, 84, 85, we see a man clearly of uh, confidence and of modernity. Look at that fashion. 
again, that fashion from the 1880s uh, that was just as up to date as that fashion would be in any other city in the United States. Um, the frame was probably fabricated um, somewhere in the east and shipped uh, west on the railroad and was commercially available. But this image of Juan Jose Baca um, is fairly large. Um, it's about uh, 28 inches tall. And when Juan Jose Baca wanted to have his photograph taken and printed of this size, unfortunately, there was no technology available in Albuquerque to create a photograph of this scale. Um, even though he went to the best uh, photographer, the best uh, photographic studio, the most well-respected photographic studio in the 1880s, which was owned by Emma Luce Albright. Mrs. Albright owned the Albright Art Parlors. And so Juan Jose Baca presented her with this challenge. I want a large format photograph. Mrs. Albright said, okay, we'll make it look like a photograph, but we'll have to do a charcoal drawing. So this is a charcoal drawing by Mrs. Albright or one of her studio assistants made to look like a photograph, not made to look like a drawing because photography was modern and Mr. Baca wanted to be a man of modernity. Thus, he created a portrait of himself that is so avant-garde that the technology to create it did not exist in the state of New Mexico. His vision for himself, his vision for built business and commerce in Albuquerque was so advanced uh, that it predated the arrival of the technology that could make that possible. It's truly an astonishing statement about the way that business leaders here in Albuquerque were considering themselves. Uh, so by the time we get to 1970, we have a very different story. Um, not only the demolition of some of the great historic structures, including the Alvarado, um, but also student protests and the arrival of the, um, the guard, the National Guard arriving on UNM campus. And I love this image of these students looking very modern, very up-to-date in 1970s fashion, almost flying, floating, almost like angels across the pavement um, at the University of New Mexico um, at a way that in the 1950s, photographers documented Albuquerque as being very, very up-to-date, 1958. Um, and you can see the U and the hills there in the distance for the University of New Mexico. And this up-to-date modern house documented as the future of Albuquerque while stretching off to the east towards the mountains are just um, endless acres of what was probably tumbleweed at that time. So modernity arrived in Albuquerque while we were still trying to stamp out the stereotypes of the West, the tumbling tumbleweed. Um, other photographs in the 1960s uh, document um, the road uh, heading into Albuquerque um, from the uh, northeast, uh, the northwest. And you can see the uh, Sandia uh, crest in the background while the road that extends now past uh, Rio Rancho and the expanding suburbs of the Northwest of our community uh, completely open and uh, open to interpretation, open to potential. While downtown um, in the 1960s, uh, we see the um, presence of 12th and Central Avenue looking almost the same as it looks to this day. There's the dog house um, there, um, the high rise um, on 14th Street. Um, and um, basically most of these buildings continuing to exist. Uh, the fire um, hydrant has been replaced. Uh, the dog has gone on to better things, but otherwise some parts of Albuquerque still feel the same as they did in the 1960s. Um, Will Wilson makes a commentary about the West being one. Um, and these are, this is a double self-portrait of Diné artist or Navajo artist, Will Wilson, dressed both in the stereotype of a Navajo man, 
and dressed in the stereotype of a gentleman rancher or a gentleman cowboy looking at himself questioning what is the real New Mexico and um, who is the real Native American. Um, but to end my talk, I want to talk about this filigree butterfly because it doesn't look like much. Uh, but this filigree butterfly was advertised by the Spitz Jewelry Company. Um, and the Spitz Jewelry Company was based in Santa Fe, but had an outpost here in Albuquerque. And starting in 1885, they published an illustrated sales catalog for their filigree jewelry. Um, this butterfly was available for 20 cents, the silver butterfly, a brooch. Uh, it was advertised for 20 cents or 25 cents mail order. So in the 1880s, New Mexico was doing mail order thanks to the arrival of the railroad and they could deliver anywhere in the United States. They could deliver this traditional filigree jewelry from New Mexico anywhere in the United States, exemplifying the contemporary desire for national commerce. And it truly is astonishing to me, not just that a traditional art form here in New Mexico was one of the first products that was mail order uh, available from New Mexico, but the fact that shortly after this, um, by the 1890s, uh, certainly by the early 20th century, New Mexico had begun to reconsider how it was going to promote itself. And this particularly came from Santa Fe, from civic leaders in Santa Fe. Santa Fe was in an economic depression and they realized that they needed something that would attract business, that would attract commerce. And they decided to create an, a notion of Santa Fe being the ancient city, um, the city ancient beyond compare, remote beyond compare, Tau similarly uh, founded a group of the Tau Society of Artists that were in New Mexico to document the ancient lifeways of Native Americans, the heritage of Hispanics rooted in the ground, building spectacular churches out of adobe. And at this same point, Hispanic artists were creating filigree jewelry that was being sold across the nation. But this jewelry, as I said earlier, was being marketed as Mexican filigree. Mexican filigree that was as good as anything you could find in Mexico, that was as good as filigree jewelry um, you could find in Spain or in the Middle East. And so clearly this idea of filigree jewelry was not unique to New Mexico. So it was at this moment when filigree jewelry basically was eclipsed by the idea of Native American jewelry available to the tourist trade. And this is the time when Navajo and later Zuni and other Pueblo artists began to learn silversmithing and metalwork from the Mexican jewelers or the Hispanic jewelers in New Mexico, began to adopt the materials, creating a whole new tradition of silver jewelry incorporating in many cases turquoise and later coral um, and other materials, but began to transit, transit from a much older jewelry tradition in New Mexico to a brand new jewelry tradition that was unique to New Mexico in the hands of Native American jewelers. So this really was an attempt to create something brand new that seemed more ancient simultaneously. So as we're telling history in New Mexico, it's always more complicated to talk about this era uh, after the arrival of the railroad, when suddenly New Mexico was consciously sculpting its self-identity. Certainly Albuquerque began to sculpt its self-identity uh, as soon as the railroad arrived as a city being 
future driven, uh, looking to the stars, looking to international trade and commerce. And yet that's not always an easy sell for the tourist industry. And so we at the Albuquerque Museum are interested in telling all of these stories, celebrating the past, absolutely, but acknowledging even when we go back into the past 140 years, we still see Albuquerque being something very forward-looking, very much new. So how do we tell the contemporary when we're trying to tell a story of the past? And um, I love the fact that uh, the Albuquerque Museum has taken this on. I mentioned our photo archivist, uh, Jillian um, Hartke, who has done some wonderful exhibitions talking about the past and the present. If you haven't experienced her wonderful podcast called Picture This from the Albuquerque Museum Photo Archives, I encourage you to see the way that she pulls stories from the photographs in our archives. Also, we were joined last summer by our new curator of history, Leslie Kim, who is very interested in telling so many of these complex stories. And I look forward to uh, Leslie joining you at uh, future events possibly, and for you to come to the museum when you feel comfortable in this time of pandemic to meet Leslie and talk to her about her visions of telling the ancient and the modern and the contemporary histories of Albuquerque simultaneously. Just a couple of weeks ago, she opened a small installation celebrating recent acquisitions at the museum. And if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to do that because we tell ancient stories of the constant transmission of the culture embroidery tradition here or of women's work during the depression, preserving and canning their produce uh, so that they can survive the difficult years of the depression. But she also tells the story of uh, contemporary jewelers that are making jewelry inspired by the panic run on toilet paper and the need to wear face masks in the time of pandemic. Also moments of political triumph. Uh, for instance, when uh, Deb Holland was named as the Secretary of Interior for the United States the first Native American cabinet member in our nation's history. And she comes from our own community here in Albuquerque. There are so many challenges as we tell New Mexico history. And um, if some of you have questions or comments, I'd be very happy to hear your comments, your questions, and um, let's begin a discussion. Um, I can read the first one from Janet Sayers. I love it, Janet, you always have thoughts. Uh, Janet Sayers asks, in planning for future museum exhibits, will there be a focus on particular places? Uh, for instance, neighborhoods in Albuquerque or particular buildings, the Centennials coming for the Sunshine Building and First National Bank downtown. Uh, Janet, I think at this point, we don't have specific uh, focus on buildings or neighborhoods, but if you would like to propose an exhibition, uh, we would love to hear your thoughts for it. Um, one of the challenges that we always want to do with our exhibitions is make sure that there's a human component in our exhibitions, that we put the people back into the history. Uh, so uh, the Sunshine Building certainly is made much more engaging when we talk about the changing visitorship to the Sunshine. Uh, who was it that first patronized the Sunshine Theater uh, for what original films and movies? And then how has that changed certainly in current uh, society when the Sunshine Theater is mostly a venue for younger audiences or more contemporary uh, musical performances? So I think um, that uh, that's always very interesting, but we do wanna make sure that when we tell history, we're telling the history of human beings in our community as well. Catherine Cordova, it's good to hear from you, asks or states, the Bacas, like many leading Spanish families, were traders along the Camino Real and had tremendous access to the whole world and had for centuries. That's terrific. Um, and absolutely, Albuquerque had been a trading center for millennia. Uh, 
Uh, that's why many of our current roads that we use uh, can were built on the trading routes used by native peoples. And then subsequently with the arrival of the Camino Real and other trade routes, um, Hispanic traders built on those same heritages and traditions. So we have always been a crossroads. We've been a city where north-south trade meets east-west trade. Uh, and that very much continues to, to this day. Uh, Janet Sayers asks, uh, how far in advance are the history exhibits planned? Three to five years? Well, um, history exhibits um, like our art exhibits are planned uh, many years in advance for particularly for those that are most complex for us to secure. So uh, sometimes exhibitions, we need to book uh, three to four years in advance as soon as they're available uh, to make sure that we grab them if they're major international traveling exhibitions, such as our current exhibition focusing on Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, and Mexican modernism. Um, other exhibitions in our galleries are um, worked on a little bit um, uh, more quickly. Uh, so for instance, Leslie Kim is now working with a couple of community scholars uh, to consider how we might pay tribute to the great Laguna photographer, Lee Marmon. So uh, Leslie is looking at our schedule for next year, 2022, uh, when we have our first openings for the Kelleher Gallery uh, to see if we can have a uh, storytelling on uh, the great legacy of Lee Marmon and the way that he documented his community of Laguna and the neighboring community of Acoma. Um, Janet Sayers says 2030 is the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the railroad, which certainly changed Albuquerque's direction. Any planning to commemorate this date or have an exhibit? Well, Janet, you are um, looking way further into the future than we are able to conceive of at this point. Uh, but certainly the arrival of the railroad brought so many changes to Albuquerque, as I've indicated here. Um, that would be a great opportunity um, to talk about the arrival of the railroad and what that meant here in New Mexico and um, or certainly in Albuquerque and the rest of our state. Um, I don't know if we want to read any other uh, comments that may have come uh, through Facebook. Um, so Catherine has some great um, uh, Catherine Cordova um, addressing, yes, a very important issue. I can't believe you're not addressing the gross racist quality of that fake Kiva. Um, Catherine, I think hopefully uh, many of us that are historians on this discussion um, understand uh, what that means immediately. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to show it was just because of that um, adaptation or appropriation of other people's culture. Um, and I think um, that uh, this leads to another one of her comments. Andrew, why are you sharing this colonization perspective as whole? Is there only one way we interpret ourselves? What is the responsibility of leaders to represent a full account? Is looking forward still about making ourselves white like somewhere else? Is this a question I should have to ask? Are those of us from native and Spanish colonial origins, again, not part of the dialogue of a look at our own future? Absolutely crucial points, Catherine, and thank you so much for raising them. Um, I, as a white guy, um, tell a story that from my perspective, what we hope to do at the Albuquerque Museum is to provide a lot of different perspectives and to provide others with the opportunity to tell a story from their perspective. And I think that's one of those opportunities that we look forward to in the future, as we have done in the past. Uh, one of the most powerful exhibitions that I've seen at the museum uh, was when the museum worked with the Laguna community to tell a story of Laguna history uh, from a Laguna vantage point. And that was a very, very powerful exhibition uh, that traveled around the United States to a variety of different venues. And I certainly hope we can continue to do more like that. Uh, one of the things that we can do at the Albuquerque Museum is tell a variety of vantage points uh, because um, we have had scholars that have built important collections of 
Native American material culture, Hispanic material culture. Uh, we are trying to improve our representation of Asian American material culture, uh, African American material culture uh, here in New Mexico. So uh, we hope to be celebrating a story in the fall uh, told from an African American vantage point and uh, told by members of the African American community about African American homesteading and settlement in New Mexico. So yes, there are lots of different vantage points and I hope that we can provide the opportunity to tell more of those stories. And Catherine, thank you so much for rating, for raising that issue. Um, it certainly is something that I think all of us on staff are um, absolutely dedicated to tell. I'm looking for more questions here. Uh, Susan Drake Schwartz asks, um, is the Kelleher Gallery being used for community exhibits any longer? Uh, yes, the Albuquerque Museum is very open to community-based exhibitions. And uh, we love hearing people's thoughts and ideas about what sort of exhibitions uh, should be hosted here at the museum. And uh, whenever we receive proposals or um, ideas for community-based exhibitions, we are always happy to uh, consider those for the program. Unfortunately, uh, in the past couple of years, we have not had um, many proposals submitted to the Albuquerque Museum uh, for uh, sharing in the Kelleher Gallery, but we are always open to those sort of ideas. Many of our exhibitions in other galleries as well have come through community-based representation, uh, community-based um, recommendation for the museum. So um, I don't know if there are other questions, um, but I am very happy always to talk to, I'm looking for Facebook messages and don't know if I can find any of those. Maybe these were all submitted through Facebook. So um, I am here. Uh, I would love to hear from you, um, as are um, all of our staff. As I mentioned, our new history curator uh, began just during this time of the pandemic. So those of you um, who are used to coming to the museum on a regular basis um, and have been prevented from doing so, um, probably have not had the opportunity to meet Leslie Kim. Uh, we hope that we'll have opportunities to do that in the future um, and spend more time with our wonderful photo archivist, Jill Hartke. And uh, please do let us know your thoughts and your ideas about how the Albuquerque Museum can serve our community better. And uh, we very much appreciate the time with you all.